the final session today, we are addressing. Oh, it's not actually the final final session. Oh, I just this, have to make. Yeah. Right, the, the final session before the concluding session that will wrap it all up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Welcome back to the penultimate session <laughs> of the conference. Okay. And we're going to be focusing on material culture and memory. The choosing, making, and using of material things to preserve and regulate knowledge of the past in order to shape the historical present. And our first presenter this afternoon is Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, who is the 300th anniversary university professor at Harvard University. And she'll be speaking on chronology and time. Okay. So, um, first, a very quick explanation about where this project comes from and the strange title here, Sentimentality and Memory in 19th Century Mormonism. I am in the process, I guess for maybe seven years, I've been in the process of writing a book about 19th century Mormon families through diaries, but diaries being imagined largely, including scrapbooks. Um, I use letters as well. I'm not using memoirs in this project, which is a bit of a departure in Mormon studies. Um, and so this little, uh, really what I'm offering you today is a kind of fragmentary paper that came out of something else that I was working on in this project and that I will make a bigger paper as we um, meet our deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> really looking forward uh, to your help today. It's been a wonderful meeting and I so enjoyed it all. I thought about bringing an artifact uh, and then I didn't know if it would survive the trip. Um, but if you can imagine for me, not your water bottle, but a bottle about twice that tall, a 19th century bottle. Um, it has a cork that's rapidly deteriorating. Um, and stapled to the cork is a fragment of pink ribbon. And inside this bottle, is human hair um, and a wonderful little note in spindly handwriting that says the dark hair was mother's when she was young. The gray hair was cut off after she died. And the little golden lock, which in, you can see through the glass, has been tied with another pink ribbon was a brother's hair which was spun off his head when he stood at the end of mother's wheel, meaning her spinning wheel. <laughs> now, I'm really quite in love with this little artifact which I bought in a New Hampshire um, antique store when I was working on a book on uh, 19th century, 18th century and 19th century homespun. Um, but whenever I show it to anybody, it kind of freaks them out. <laughs> they think, this Professor Ulrich has got human hair in there. Well, human hair. We all have hair. We cut off our hair. And some people lose their hair. Um, <laughs> If you go to the hairdresser or the barber, you see lots of human hair around on the floor. And yet, there seems to be something very off-putting about this hair in the bottle. And I really love it, because not only is it an artifact of memory, remembering someone through the fragment of hair, but it also helps me to understand a cultural practice that probably, all the, certainly all the art historians in the room are very familiar with, which is the ornament and object made out of human hair. And I, it, almost any book that you read on that topic talks about um, a, a quote from Lee Hunt in the 
New Monthly Magazine and Literary Journal in 1825, where he talks about having someone, um, a friend, given him an object stolen from the Ambrosian Library in Milan, which is a single hair from a lock of hair in that library said to belong to Lucretia Borgia. <laughs> and on the envelope with this single strand of hair is the motto, and beauty draws us with a single hair. Um, I lived through as an English major, as an undergraduate, I, it felt like two weeks of line by line discussion of Alexander Pope's rape of the lock. Um, <laughs> so we know about the hair, stolen hair, exchange of hair, hair as relationships among people. Uh, this uh, hair, according to Lee Hunt, is at once the most delicate and lasting of our materials. I think he means our, our materials, our bodily materials. And it survives us like love. It is so light, so gentle, so escaping from the idea of death, that with a lock of hair belonged to a child, that has belonged to a child or friend, we may almost look up to heaven and compare notes with the angelic nature may almost say, I have a piece of thee here, not unworthy of thy being now. So we have the height of sentimentality, and we also have sentimentality collected to something trans, earthly, mm -hmm. something angelic, something almost sacred. Well, I was really interested as I began to work with 19th century Mormon materials. Now, how do I start? Do I start this by just, yeah, there I go. This is not a Mormon material. <laughs> um, the, I was, as I started working with 19th century Mormon material, what everybody says about Mormonism is that it's um, a, a throwback to um, traditional patriarchy, and that it was a reaction of these men to the new sentimental culture the sensibility that put focus on women and on affection. And it went much more to a kind of patriarchal, economic, and religious-based notion of the family. I, I discovered very quickly as I began to work with letters and diaries and artifacts that Mormons, Mormonism in the 1830s and 40s and 50s and, and continuing was absolutely saturated with sentimentality. There was nothing I found that didn't seem very much like the material culture and the literary culture of the people around them. And Mormons do not come from one place. They are gathered from out of the world, including Europe, uh, particularly British Isles and Scandinavia, and from all parts of the United States. And they start out very small, a few hundred in the 1830, and by 1888, there are like 150,000. And many of those, probably the majority, gathered into the Rocky Mountains where they were driven um, after, 18, after the founding prophet's death in 1844. So here we have a sort of classic, wonderful, wonderful hair scrapbook. So the idea is you don't only share, uh, exchange hair with um, a lover, but uh, young women would collect their friend's hair and weave it into little friendship tokens, and then could keep a scrapbook and save these. This is from Vermont, um, from a collection of American folklore. This is a Mormon <laughs> artifact, and I guess you can see my point. Um, this is from a woman named uh, Zina Huntington, who to the end of her life, she became a polygamous wife, she lived in Utah, but to the end of her life, she preserved this little token that she had received probably in 1830s or 40s from a friend. Um, and they have various verses, but I, I want to just read one of them. Dear friend, except the lock of hair which you have oft so oft seen me wear. I've worn it when in friendship's bower and passed with you the social hour. This little present kindly take and keep it for the giver's sake. 
And when this lock of hair you see, my dear, dear friend, remember me. So the lock becomes a connecting point for a friendship. Now, um, over time, um, scrapbooks are not enough. This is from a Harvard collection of a, a family in uh, eastern Massachusetts that collected hair over a period of time. And then a member of the family wove all of these different locks with beads and wire into a bouquet, which becomes an unusual kind of family tree formed out of the physical remnants of the members. And then this is the artifact that has me really fascinated and wanting to do something with this paper. This is also a bouquet, a wreath, horseshoe-shaped wreath, um, made out of human hair. This is interesting. It was, um, as the inscription tells us, it was made from the officers and members of the Manti South Ward Relief Society. That would be the women's organization in the little pioneer town of Manti, Utah. Um, and it was made by sister, excuse the typo, Mary Winch of Manti, and was presented by her to the Manti Temple. So the question that I'm asking and raising here is, is this just a kind of happenstance interesting thing, a work of art presented to the temple, or is this an interesting example of a popular cultural practice of re receiving a kind of sacred, sacralized meaning through its association with a religious ritual? And I'm not sure, but I think that's a question I have to ask. And it, I could argue, and I'm still working on this, whether sentimentality, and there are a number of these practices, actually facilitated the embracing on the part of these members from all over everywhere um, into the really radical doctrines of 19th century Mormonism. Among them is there is no such thing as immaterial matter. Spirit is matter, only finer. Or the idea that we could be connected to people gone, dead. We can be connected to dead relatives and friends by performing vicarious baptisms for those persons in a holy temple. And the first, ten, the first baptisms for the dead are performed in the Mississippi River while they're building the first temple at Nauvoo. And as soon as they got the basement finished, they built a font in the temple to perform vicarious baptisms. And then as the temple was completed, they completed the temple even though they knew they had to leave because they were being mobbed out and there were a lot of other issues. Um, because they wanted to perform additional ceremonies which would seal them to each other and to their ancestors into heaven. So friendship and friend was a name for both relatives and non-relatives in the 19th century. To be sealed to your friends for eternity was the highest pinnacle point of Mormonism. So look at this wreath. The interesting thing to me is what appears to be a vase in this wreath. Um, it was in the second temple built in Utah. It's a beautiful thing, built out of native sandstone in 1880, completed in 1888. And I don't have a picture of the baptismal font in the, in the Manti temple, but I do have of the one in the Salt Lake Temple, which is very similar to the pattern was set in Nauvoo. And in all the temples, the font is supported through by 12 oxen, uh, sculptured oxen, which stand for the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's bringing all of God's children together through this vicarious work 
baptismal work, bodily work in the temple. So um, <laughs> that's my story, my problem, my opportunity. So the ladies made this, and <clears throat> this is the inscription that came with it. You remember the inscription I read earlier? You've seen, dear friends, you've seen me wear this. Uh, now when you see it, remember me. So it says, these locks of hair, O oh Lord, thou hast seen us wear. So now we commit them to thy holy temple's care. Um, and the organization itself is fascinating, the organization of women around the female Relief Society and the contributions that they've made um, to the building of these temples um, throughout this period. And if this was made a sacred relic as it came into the temple, it is no longer one, unless we think museums are sacred places, <laughs> because this relic is now in the Church History Museum in Salt Lake City. Um, there was one in a similar hair wreath in the Salt Lake Temple that's in another museum in Salt Lake now. Um, so I suppose at some point, hair began to freak people out <laughs> and no longer uh, was it used in that sacred space. So now I'd like to introduce um, Christopher Lovelock, who's an associate professor and reader in the Department of Archaeology at the University of Nottingham. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Thank you. And, and thank, thank you uh, to Ivan, Sarah, and, and the funders, uh, and all the speakers, too, for such a great event. Um, <coughs> can we just... Yeah? Okay, thanks. Okay, then, in the next ten minutes, um, I'm going to explore three themes um, to illustrate how memory, both memory and forgetting, uh, and cycles of time, influence the use, creation of material culture and associated social practices and use of space uh, among coastal and maritime oriented societies of early medieval northern Europe. Uh, now just to pick up on Henry's points this morning, um, all the contemporaries in the early medieval period simply called it our era, okay? So they thought they were modern, okay? Okay then, so, so um, I'll, look at three, I'll look at three themes in particular. First of all, um, how material culture and memory were used to create uh, new identities in coastal zones between late of 5th and late 6th century, uh, the late, late 6th centuries. And I'll use one example from what we call Anglo-Saxon societies, but they never did. Uh, and I'll use another example from what happens uh, in my part of the world, the Atlantic Rim, Wales, uh, Scotland, Ireland. And then I'll look at um, how coastal societies went through cycles of maritime orientation. Uh, just because people lived by the sea doesn't mean they actually used it or related to it. <coughs> and finally, I'll finish off um, looking at how representation and memory were used in a sort of battleground for social status between the emerging mercantile and seafaring elites who are working on the basis of portable wealth and the landed, sometimes called, or used, they used to be feudal elites uh, <coughs> between the 10th and the 13th centuries and the arena that I'll be exploring are the port towns. Okay then, to, <coughs> to start off, um, I want to look at two brief case studies um, looking at how memory and material culture were used to create um, identities in the post-Roman British Isles in the, between the mid-5th and the late 6th century. <clears throat> and the example I'm going to choose from Anglo-Saxon England is the construction of the identity of late 5th and 6th century Kent. Now, I could call this an Anglo-Saxon society, but they called it the Society of Kent. Kent is derived from the Roman um, tribal societal name, not from any immigrant name. But <clears throat> um, in the late seventh century, we have a churchman, a man called Bede, who tells us that the elites of Kent in his day um, chose to have as ancestors, or, or perceived their ancestors to have been um, immigrant Jutes from Jutland. Okay, and I, I work in Jutland, and, and <clears throat> I'm going to explore this through the uh, medium of mortuary ritual, a okay, furnished burial in particular. 
Um, and I just wanted to show you um, what wealthy, first of all, we'll start with the women, what wealthy 5th century furnished burial attire looks like in Jutland. And that's what it looks like by the early 6th century. And I'm just going to explore um, what we find in Kent itself. So you can see how much was um, total fabrication, how much was memory. Um, so, for example, we do find in um, a significant number of female graves, and this is important, of the end of the 5th and 6th century, they used this material which was used in Jutland between the late 4th and mid 5th century. So it looks like heirlooms, okay? Um, and that looks like a nice little cluster. So if you just looked at these, they're called gold bracteates, um, they're sort of pendants. They looks as if there's a lot of uh, back referencing of Jutland. But if you look at the other things that are also in the same graves as this material, we also find this sort of material culture. And that material culture, that brooch form, the coit brooch form, is undoubtedly 5th century British. Okay? So just as they're, they're back referencing the name of their society is that of Kent, it's not uh, an immigrant title, they're using 5th century British material culture in the same heirloom fashion. <coughs> what they're also using at the same time in much greater numbers are these later 5th and 6th century Frankish brooches from across the channel here. So what is Jutish in Jutland in the 5th and 6th centuries certainly isn't anything like that in Kent. And we're looking at the grabbing and the retention of old material culture forms in creating something new. And I think this is a parallel to Colleen's paper yesterday in terms of creating something, creating a future from the relics of the past. Now, one of the things that is very interesting is that amongst male graves, furnished graves, of the later 5th and 6th century in Kent, um, there is nothing from Jutland at all. Yet yeah, these were probably the paramount group by the late 7th century who were the ones who were key in wanting to have Jutish ancestry. And the material culture that they use is pretty much all derived, or the, it, it's, it's totally cross-channel with the Frankish areas. Okay? So here we're looking at, by the 7th century, an oral ancestry uh, chosen by probably a male elite. They want to associate themselves with Jutland. But if you look at the material culture of the time, it's a total fabrication. Right, okay, so that's the Anglo-Saxon case study. And I want to look at the um, use of memory in my part of the world. Now, what we see uh, in terms of, of Western Britain, uh, so Cornwall, Wales, um, and very significantly, Scotland beyond the former Roman Empire, and also Ireland beyond the former Roman Empire, we see a very interesting phenomenon of, if you like, a post-Roman Romanisation. So these, these societies, which were the least Romanized, they, they chose to be Romanized the least when they were under Roman occupation. <laughs> In the 50 years after the Roman sort of civil and military administration had left, we actually find them desperately grabbing every cultural trait that you can find that is within their context, their view of what's Roman. It's the late antique package, so we get the adoption of Christianity. But it's not just Christianity, it's a whole new sort of uh, range of life ways. So we're looking at new foodstuffs from the Mediterranean, from, from the Los Angeles Eastern Mediterranean. We're looking at fine wares from North Africa. Um, we're looking at various sort of decorative sort of Byzantine intaglios in the 7th century. We're looking at the widespread adoption of Latin. Um, you know, these were the least uh, Romanized um, elements of society. And also in terms of Christian culture and uh, producing books and Christian images, we're looking at the importation of um, exotic dyes. This is orpiment. Uh, it makes the, the yellow manuscript dye. Um, and this is probably imported from um, the Vesuvius region. It's found in this little hilltop um, settlement um, called Dunad in Argyle in western Scotland. And that seems to have been an elite centre. And basically the secular elite is provisioning the nearby monastery at Iona um, with these exotic, you know, new exotic um, materials by the time we're getting into the 7th century. So basically, we've got two contrasts. We've got Anglo-Saxon England um, using some elements from um, southern Scandinavia, northern Germany, other elements from the UK, and, or from um, eastern Britain and northern France. And in the west, we've got reusing um, a memory of Rome that was never there, or they never chose to follow 
uh, when the Romans were actually there. Okay then, so that's, that's the first theme. If I go on to the second theme in terms of um, the way time um, and maritime orientation changed radically uh, in the early medieval centuries, um, I'm going to look at two case studies either side of the North Sea so we can actually um, follow certain trends. And the first site we'll look at, um, I have to use sort of, unfortunately I have to cherry pick examples, um, is the estate centre um, of Flixborough Connorsby um, here, just to the, on, on the River Trent, just to the south of the Humber Estuary in uh, the central east coast region of England. It is the key arterial routeway into uh, central England for, for um, exotic goods in this period. And this um, estate centre at, at Flixborough, here we're not dealing with one item of material culture, we're dealing with 40 buildings within a sequence from the 7th to the 10th century. We're dealing with 6,000 iron artefacts thrown away, some in stage structured deposits, other in tertiary refuse <coughs> deposits. We're dealing with 1,000 copper alloy and silver and gold artefacts. We're dealing with 89 glass vessels, um, 250,000 hand collected animal bones and millions in the city. So, so here we've got a different element of scale here to look at um, <coughs> social practices. Well, I'm going to compare that with uh, another segment I'm currently involved in excavation, that's a, that's a Harvard professor in an excavation trench, Mike McCormick put, put to work. Uh, <coughs> okay. um, and here, here we have on the opposite side of the, on the North Sea, on the Kattegat Strait, at a place called Stansayer and Herning, we have the well-known stave church at Herning. It's just up here on the hill. That's a reconstruction of it in, in the 1060s. And below that, a newly discovered field edge uh, settlement with um, harbour facility, which is roughly covering 50 to 60 hectares, which I've been involved in surveying uh, and excavating in the last sort of five, six years. I'm going to look at the different sort of patterns in maritime orientation, whether we can see similarities and changes through time. And the first thing is, in terms of, let's start with Flixborough, between the mid 7th and the late, late 8th centuries, we see maritime connection at all levels. So, for example, we're seeing, I believe it or not, rack of dolphin. Uh, dolphins are a documented feast species. We have up to 30 of them at this time on the site. They lock the head off, they lock the tail off, and they serve them as rack of dolphins. So, there's that direct maritime ori uh, orientation there. We're also seeing uh, imported glass vessels, okay, sorry, <laughs> um, and also um, imports from across. Northern Europe. And we see exactly the same as Stan said. The Viking Age, however, is bad for both. It's not just um, uh, bad for England. And by the 10th century, 11th century, we see a total disappearance of direct maritime connection in terms of exotic artifacts. And we see a return only to the local resources. And we see it on both sides of the North Sea. Okay. Yeah. So just to finally uh, gloss over the port towns. Now, port towns <coughs> start to accrue very, very wealthy merchant artisan families in the 10th century. And they have a very exotic lifestyle of portable wealth. This is a, a wooden and silver inlaid saddle from York Coppergate. And this is, um, we get weapons and, uh, and silk garments. <coughs> it's also the same place where we get this helmet thrown away or, or placed very carefully next to the mercantile tenements. This is a mid-8th century fantastic um, uh, helmet. Um, all of the analysis to date is focused on, on the very nice art historical decoration of it. <coughs> what hasn't received the attention is the fact that it's next to these mercantile and art artisan tenements. Um, and one of the th key themes of this is, to come back to what Laura said this morning, um, are we actually seeing sumptuary sort of actions um, coming here in the sense that in the 950s, when it was actually deposited, uh, the West Saxons had conquered the Kingdom of York. And previously, these artisans in these regions um, seemed to have enjoyed a much greater freedom. But then the West Saxons, the Southerners, who are really disliked by the Northern Anglo-Saxons, take charge. And you wonder whether there's some sort of sumptuary um, sort of impetus here in terms of what can merchants get away with wearing. Uh, and so this old artefact that may have been taken from an earlier owners may have been unacceptable um, 
in terms of its, its wearing in front of landed aristocrats um, at this time. And finally, um, <coughs> just to look at the fact that these urban elites um, have real political power by the mid 11th and mid 12th centuries. Um, women are very important in these towns. They own property, they sell it, they're wives of moneyers, spice merchants. <coughs> and in terms of the way society is represented by landed elites in the church of the period, um, these vibrant worlds of port towns with their, um, their merchants, their uh, spice merchants, their global connections, and their propertied women are always totally ignored or omitted in the iconography of the period. That could be lack of perception, but by the 12th century, this scheme has been used for 200 years, and they know very well that the um, elites of the port towns are actually key actors in society. They lead the Anglo-Norman contingent in the um, Second Crusade in 1147, and they omit, are omitted totally. So it's almost a deliberate forgetting uh, here within the, within the feudal hierarchy. this paper. You could do that with more than one way, but I kiss this paper and then when you get it, you can kiss this paper and we are connected. I mean, it's just everywhere, um, weeping over gravestones, weeping over a grave, and of course the, the, the emphasis on the family in Mormonism, which is so visible in the genealogical practice and so on, that's happening broadly in this period. The, the family records, some of the actual imagery out of early fam, uh, il illustrated family records that are often done, hand done or embroidered, you know, turns up in religious contexts as well. Is there, are there differences between them? Well, that's the question. Yeah. The, ob the meaning does not inhere in the object. I mean, that's what I would argue. It's, it's what is the meaning attached to the persons. And um, uh, this is complicated. I mean, what I'm, re I'm really trying to, in the larger project, to think about this problem of plural affection, plurality. Mm -hmm. And I think it's all over the place in sentimental culture. And I think it becomes easier then to have a household with more women than normal. <laughs> I mean, my book is called The House Full of Females. Um, <laughs> uh, but the real question is how that gets into the religion or does not. So the sentimental poetry talks about mother in heaven, for example, coming from one of the women. Okay, so now we have um, Anne, then um, Peter, Henry, then Steve. So we have a lot of hands. So Anne, do you want to go? Thanks, both of you, for really interesting papers. Um, my question is for Laurel. It's not actually. It's not really a question. I just I'm so excited by the recuperation of sentimentality from the. I mean, t typically is a term of derision, right? Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and so I wanted to. I, I noticed in your paper that you talked a little bit about the 18th century use of sentiment, and so I wanted to just say something about that and see what you think. Um, so in, in my field, in the philosophy of art, when people use sentimental as a term of derision, um, it's typically construed as the, there's an emotional response to an object, but the object has provoked that response kind of on the cheap. 
mm -hmm. as it were. Yeah. Hence, like tear drinking <laughs> over the slave. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Breathing you know, into the teacup over the slave. Kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, so it's, what's interesting is it's not that the not that the object, whatever it is, doesn't merit the response. It's that it's that, the, that it's that it's too easily gained. Um. And the thing about the 18th century conception of sentiment is that there's this, here's my plug for the normative again, there's, there's an idea that sentimental responses are um, a way of perceiving value in an object, and so can be properly directed or misdirected. So this idea of sentimentality as, a, as sort of being had on the cheek kind of falls out of that notion you know, what we might now call an emotional response can be um, properly directed to an object when it, when it is a perception of the value in the object. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting idea that I feel like, you know, fall, it has just fallen away. And now all we're left with is just this term sentimental. That's right. Term I, 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 and certainly in political, American political history, there's a recovery of the sentimental. Seminal Jefferson and so on, and the importance of feeling, feeling creating morality, um, and kind of put you know the Scottish philosophers uh, rather than the, the more rationalist view. But I think the denigration in the 19th century comes from popularization, and then from the reaction against it. So with hair, of course, it's little Eva in Uncle Tom you know, cutting off the locks of hair in an almost sacramental. I mean, that really get edges into a religious. And it's the, you know, it's the damn scribbling females that we were all taught to resist <laughs> as undergraduates in my generation, but not in, the, and not in yours. Um, are now being taken more seriously, and therefore we can take those forms of expression more seriously. Um, I was, Laurel, very much taken with the description of the baptism of the dead, and you are identifying it as a way of materializing the relationship to the past. And so I have two questions, one intensive, yeah. one extensive. The intensive one is, is there a Mormon literature describing the relationship to the past that accompanies the practice. Uh -huh. And the second is to think about an inventory in other cultures of similar attempts. So I'm thinking of uh, an ancient Palmyra where they had portrait busts in the house. Mm -hmm. but, um, but when does baptism of the dead extend so far back or beyond the family that it's not uh, ancestor worship, but actually about past people? Way, way past. That's really, really interesting and complicated. I'm, maybe even Christine can help me, Colleen can help me out here. But initially, I think it's very much uh, their immediate kin and you know grandparents. By the end of the 19th century, this genealogical focus is really intense. Now, I think it's there earlier for some people, particularly it may already be in certain cultures that they're <coughs> coming from. But imagine into the forecast. But for Joseph Smith, there is no question but what the whole earth has got to be bound together. All, all of the tribes, and they can be adopted into these tribes if they accept the right kind of religious principles. And he says there must be a welding link of some kind from all the generations back to Adam. So in one of his writings, you have Adam and Eve in the middle of Missouri, because he identifies where they went after the Garden of Eden that's in the center of America. And they gather all of their children for generations around them. So it's very much in the theology. Uh, connect everything, 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 which may be, in Colleen's terms, we see an erasure of history as change by collapsing all dispensations into one in this restoration of the dispensation of fullness of times, which is what they call it.
Yes. <clears throat> My question is for both of you on the issue of gender. Uh, for Laurel, um, you started out by talking about the image of the Mormon or Mormonism as patriarchy, um, but didn't, in my own hearing of it, uh, link it to the issues of sentimentality. Mm -hmm. I presume that it's women who are weaving the hair mm -hmm. and making the uh, various compositions mm -hmm. um, and expressing sentimentality in these poems and in other ways. What are the men doing? Uh, the and men what are is, uh, so okay. that's, that, that's part of it. Um, All right. <laughs> and so how, can, how does this relate to gender relationships, men and women? And are Mormon men supposed to be unsentimental and therefore patriarchal or apart from this notion of family and friend? Do uh, Mormon men call each other's brothers or do they also use the term friend? So it's the issues of gender relationship in that account. Um, and then, uh, Chris, uh, you mentioned in, in the description, maybe I didn't get it quite right, but you were emphasizing the fact that those medallions and pendants came from female graves, and those are the ones that were coming from Jutland or had connections to Jutland, but the men were choosing images from the, the French or Franco yeah. world. So yeah. there what's is no, going on? There is now? nothing from Jutland. In, in male graves of the of the okay. late 15th is, century in case. Is gender yeah. distinction in, yeah. f in funeral goods of men and women different? And what does that tell us about what's happening on the coast and in inland? Well, it's it's you know it's it's very strange that there aren't any. Uh, there is no back reference within male graves. Um, <clears throat> and really after after the early to mid sixth century there's there's almost no back referencing in female graves either. So um, but it is it, it, it's a real paradox. We know by the late seventh century the elite in Kent wanted to back reference their ancestry in terms of a foundation with to Jutland. Um, but any affiliation with Jutland was only expressed in female graves. And obviously Women, women, the women didn't bury themselves, so so these these items of accoutrements, these, these accoutrements, these grave goods were placed within those graves, presumably by male family members as well, uh, you know, standing around the grave. Um, but you know, within the actual process of of interring uh, a woman, um, if she had one of these brackets, these these pendants, it's very strange that they only choose to show any affiliation with each other in a female grave, and they often do that alongside. Um, the accompaniment with Frankish brooches and sometimes one of those British coin brooches. So, you know, at the time, in, in the later 5th and 6th centuries, um, they were signalling a whole range of social relationships, both indigenous, sometimes made with Jutland, and more often with contemporary Francia across the Whereas the men, everything is, is you know, it's, it's either indigenous, um, or you have those those swords, for example, they call Bifons Gilton type swords, um, and you have as many of those in Frankia as you do in Kent. So, so it's very very interesting that they're signalling that that sort of affiliation only in a component of female burial culture. Uh, in reality, by the seventh century, you see no sign of it apart from the word of a cleric who works in the north of England. Uh, but we assume that he has knowledge of the, of the, um, the foundation of ancestry myths uh, of, of contemporary uh, Kentish the, the men are sentimental uh, <coughs> in that early period. It's a shared culture. The men don't weave um, friendship tokens. They put the strands of hair in the top of a cane with a little crystal top on it. Um, and there are gender differences in the way they interact, but I, I see it in both. Now, that may change. There is real conflict for reasons I don't have time to go into um, as we get into the century. And so you get a kind of tug of, tug of war early on um, between some concepts and other concepts. And uh, the, the gender dynamics are that they're going to take the whole book to express okay. those. <laughs> <laughs> so you're time for just Steve and then... Um, oh. 
Yeah, uh, well, so I, I, have, I have a question for each of you, and, and, and try as, as I might, I can't figure out a way to tie them together, alas. <laughs> so if you'll indulge me. Um, Chris, uh, you know, I think you may have provided finally that answer to, to the John Cleese question, what have the Romans ever done for us? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> apparently in Western England. Uh, but I was, I was to speculate, I mean, I was fascinated by this. Why there, uh, and not in other parts, presumably, of the island, do you have some sense of, of, of how we could explain why after the fact now we're, we're, we're picking up Latin? Yeah, I mean, it's... I think in Western Britain you get that grabbing of that late, an, late antique perception of what is Roman in the face of the creation of these new Eastern Eastern societies, so uh, which, which are also adopting Old English as well. It's not just a material culture transformation, it's a linguistic transformation. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a resistance against... I think it is. It's, yeah. it's a defining us from then. Um, um, but of course, um, we, we do get the use of Latin in terms of monumental inscriptions and the language of the church, but we don't get... You know, we, we still see the use of indigenous languages, so, say in, in Wales and Cornwall, uh, it used to be called P-Celtic, now, now it's archaeo neo But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway um, I failed uh, that. But, but, yeah, <laughs> but, but, but so, so I think it is, it, it is about defining us from then. Okay. Um, and, you know, the other thing is that I said you know, it was post revolutionization the, the re we know that was the case, but contemporaries at the time with, a, with a, uh, an awareness of the longevity of Rome may not have realised that the Romans were not coming back. Mm. If you look, so, so, so within that context too, um, they're choosing a range of markers um, and they're still affiliated themselves with their perception um, of 5th of century Romanitas. And of course, they were in very, in very close contact with Western Gaul, uh, increasingly signs down the Spanish coast, and you know, there was direct transshipment through to the Eastern Mediterranean too. So, so they were within that context, they were affiliating with their contemporary Byzantine right. sort, of, sort of, of idea of Roman Romanism. So, so you actually did provide me with, with my link maybe now to, to Laurel, um, with the us versus them question, because obviously, this, the, the, the producing of, uh, of, of these hair weavings and the portrait, I and mean, this, is, this is widespread across uh, the United States um, at this moment. And, and so you were wrestling with the question of whether these objects become sacred because they have participated in a temple ritual or they've been inserted there. I was wondering in the opposite direction, if this isn't really a part of taking a set of sacred impulses and participating in this wider, broader secularization uh, that's going on across the 19th century? Um, that's a complicated question. It's a little bit early for that because at the moment these things are being made, uh, well, not participating. Let, let me rephrase that. Um, the us versus them is we're as good as you. Mm -hmm. Um, and but I'm not so sure anybody got any credit from weaving hair by 1880. <laughs> they they're what they have is the vote yeah. at that point, and there is a very outspoken proto-feminist movement in Utah by that period, and they are very very sensitive to the fact that they are in fact civilized ladies, and they are not the awful people that they're being portrayed, or the victims. So that is true, but the, the practices go way back to the beginning, and so I don't think that quite explains it. Okay, so just quickly, John, did you want to ask your question? Oh, just a brief observation for, about the, the Mormon hair ornaments. Um, a beautiful example of the body's material culture, and you didn't really talk much about the body, but sort of how people transform bodies into relations between things. Mm -hmm. um, on a slightly different topic, I was wondering if you'd learn anything interesting if you tried doing DNA analysis on those. Oh boy, I would love to. <laughs> Particularly the Manti wreath, because I think there's an awful lot of blonde hair in there. <laughs> and this is San Pete County, which is populated by Scandin nice. a lot of Scandi uh, Scandinavians okay. who tend to be blue-eyed and the ones coming in. Mm. to Utah. Um, but, you know, these are museum <laughs> artifacts. Yes, yeah, okay. We'll never get permission. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, great. Thank you.